Hey everyone, Dan Takashi here. This week, a major announcement came out. Besides the fact that the Prime Minister of Japan resigned, there was also another major announcement from the U.S. Central Bank. Jerome Powell, president of the U.S. Central Bank, the FOMC, announced a new policy change that was, has not been done in about three decades. Completely new. It will change monetary policy in the U.S. permanently, also change it in the world. This is going to affect so many parts of our portfolio. And I wanted to give you guys an update. For those of you new viewers and subscribers, my name is Dan Takahashi. I'm a former Wall Street guy. Please see the description area below as to who I am. A former Wall Street guy, traveled the world, and just started YouTube uh, just a few months ago with the Japanese channel about in January and this English channel uh, only about two and a half months ago. So please uh, press subscribe below and uh, hopefully you'll follow me going forward. Today's topic, I want to break up into three main themes. Number one, let's talk about what actually happened. Why is this so important? I've heard a lot of other stuff on YouTube and social media, but I'll give you my take of why this is so important from uh, someone with, uh, let's say, uh, from economics and finance background, what I think, uh, why I think this is important. And then number two, we'll go into exactly what this is going to affect in the U.S. stock markets and what's going to happen going forward, because I think this has a major impact on the New York Dow, Dow Jones. And then number three, I'll give you my recommendation for what I think you should do with your portfolio and your money today. So let's get started. First and foremost, what happened? What was this piece of news? So just to give you guys an insight, on Thursday, U.S. time, this was August 27th, Jackson Hole Symposium was announced. This is a once a year meeting whereby the global central bank leaders get together and they basically discuss their monetary policy outlook. Now, global central banks control money supply in the world. It's not really the government, it's the global central banks. And the largest global central bank is the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve president, his name is Jerome Powell. And what he announced during this meeting is historical. Why is it so historical? Well, let's back up for a second. What is the point of the U.S. Central Bank? What is their purpose? You look at the history, the U.S. Federal Reserve by, was first shaped and created in 1913 in the U.S. Federal Reserve Act. And then its role was even further clarified in 1977, establishing what's known as a dual mandate. What's a dual mandate? Dual mandate usually means two mandates. It's actually more like three mandates kind of mixed into two. Uh, it should be maximum employment. That's the first one. And then the number two slash three is the stable prices and moderate long-term interest rates. Now, these are a little bit similar in the fact that stable prices basically means current short-term prices. Today, what you see today, what inflation's rising today, you go to the store, how much does it cost to buy food, gasoline, et cetera, et cetera. Long-term interest rates, these are really the bond prices. Longer term, the cost of borrowing for people and for governments across the world. Well, the U.S. government and the this is known as its dual mandate. Now, for the most of uh, the Federal Reserve's history, especially the last 30 years, the focus has really been on this part, stable prices and long-term interest rates. Not as much focus on maximum employment. And actually, what has happened is that when the economy has started to reach what the Fed deems as full employment, the Fed has actually started to uh, get hawkish as an in increase in interest rates. Now, for those of you who just uh, didn't quite understand what I said, basically the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates when they want to basically slow down a heating economy. It's overheating. And they will lower interest rates when the economy is too slow to try and pump up the economy and support it. Now, usually what they've been doing, especially the last 30 years, is when they think that the economy is at maximum, unemployment, maximum employment level, as in the economy has uh, taken the maximum number of people possible, they, uh, in fear of overheating, they will start increasing interest rates. And this actually happened over the last few years over with Janet Yellen, the previous uh, Federal Reserve chairman, uh, raised interest rates from roughly the uh, beginning of, sorry, the middle of 2015, all the way to the early, well, about middle 2019, interest rates were being raised because of this. Now, Jerome Powell, he is changing the game. He is changing the rules. He is changing the outlook, uh, especially the longer term policy for the Federal Reserve. Now, what exactly is he doing? So, 
usually the Federal Reserve, they target what's called about 2% inflation. Inflation is the raise of rising of prices. It's basically stuff around us, right? Food, gasoline, uh, just anything around you. It's, it's the rising. Now, usually the Federal Reserve wants to target about 2%. That's what economists have deemed around the world as a stable rise in prices. You don't want zero because then there's no incentive for people to invest their money right? If prices are rising around you at 2%, there's a small incentive to uh, investing things around you to deploy your cash. Don't let it just sit. If you just let it sit and do nothing, that's very bad for the economy because the money does not go around. So 2% is known to be what economists think around the world as a uh, deemed to be a good rate of inflation. So that's usually what the Fed targets. Now, this time, the Fed's not really changing that part. I mean, they are a little bit changing it in the fact that they are saying that 2% inflation run uh, is uh, they're still their target, but they're going to uh, allow for short term periods where they are above 2% for some time to achieve a longer run 2% inflation. So uh, this was a little bit of a change in before and the fact that they are going to allow inflation to go above 2% uh, temporarily to make sure that the long run average is about two. Now, the other bigger change, I think, is that what's regarding their unemployment. Now, what does this mean? So longer term, their goal now is that they're actually going to allow for overemployment. What am I talking about here? So their dual mandate is maximum employment and stable prices, right? For the most part, stable prices, they're going to allow for above 2% temporarily. Why? Because the Federal Reserve hasn't really been hitting 2% long run recently. United States inflation right now for the last few years since the great financial crisis, it's averaging a little bit below 2%. So they're saying now, okay, temporarily, we're going to boost it and target above 2%, right? That's the, sta that's, that's the stable prices part. The next part is full employment part. They're going to start targeting uh, higher full employment numbers. So to make sure that uh, this is ba basically to make sure that uh, the maximum number of people are going to be deployed all the time. And this will ensure that uh, this is actually very what is called dovish. And it's a 30 year change. And the fact that the Fed has not really targeted this part of its dual mandate in such a long time, even though it's been there, it's always been there ever since 1977. But now they're going to really actively target it, giving it further impetus to be even uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, keen towards to be dovish as in more and more monetary policy. Basically, guys, this is very reflationary, super reflationary. Now, let's get to the second part of the video. Number two. What impact will this have on the market specifically? Why am I looking at the Dow Jones? First and foremost, guys, the Dow Jones. What is the Dow Jones? The Dow Jones is one of the major uh, stock market indices in the world. There's two major ones, usually for the US. It's S&P 500 and Dow Jones. Other people look at the NASDAQ for the tech, but these are the two biggest ones. The main difference between these two is the red is the Dow Jones, the uh, blue is the S&P 500. Dow Jones has a much bigger weight in industrials in financials and consumer discretionary and has a lower weight uh, in technology. It has almost no, it has no companies in utilities and real estate. So this is the major difference. And why am I targeting? What does this have to do with today's announcement with what, uh, what not this week's announcement with Federal Powell, uh, Federal Reserve Powell? Because now Sectors that were under targeted that have been underperforming, I believe, are starting to move. What the heck are you talking about, Dan? Let's look at more specifically the main sectors in the US. I've divided up into these main ETFs here. It's the tech sector. It's the consumer discretionary retail. Uh, I believe this is consumer staples, healthcare, financials, energy, uh, industrials. These are the main sectors here that are composed of uh, the Dow Jones that we were just talking about earlier. Now, looking at this, there's something interesting that's going on here. The last couple days after Federal Reserve policy was, well, after this Jackson Hole Symposium was announced, something to me, what I think is a little peculiar started to happen. Looking at a daily chart here, we're seeing that the first day when it was announced, tech was actually down. Today it was up a little bit, Friday which is 28th time US, but it was down on the 27th. Also looking at consumer discretionary. This was down initially, and then today was just up a little bit. Retail also was down on the 27th. 
These sectors were not as strong, even though the market was quite strong. The overall market, the S&P 500 and Dow were up over the last two days in a row. Yet these were down and certain sectors were doing well, mainly financials. Financials did very, very well. The first day on the 27th, it actually had a very nice performance up. It went up about 1.4, 1.5% or so on the 27th when the day that this uh, new policy was announced. And today it went up again 0.4%. Energy also, very interestingly, went up 1.8%, mainly today, mainly because the dollar was going down. But nonetheless, it was interesting to note the last two days it's had a very nice performance. Why is this happening? What does that have to do with the Federal Reserve new policy? Basically, this new policy is very, very reflationary. Reflationary meaning that it is going to even push for more inflation into the economy just because the Fed has been missing its target and they are acknowledging that they've been missing the longer term 2% target range. So they're going to push for even more inflation. Powell is saying, I am more reflationary, more dovish than my predecessor, Janet Yellen. And this is pushing up what's called U.S. bond yields. Now, U.S. yields, I'm going to be looking at today what's called the U.S. 10-year government bond yield. And looking at the 10-year government bond yield, what's interesting is that it is moving quite higher the last couple of days, especially the day that uh, Powell made his announcement. It has moved quite higher. And now as the U.S. reserve, uh, sorry, the U.S. yields move up, this is good for financials. That's right. It's good for financials. It will move, it's good for financial banks. Why? Because banks, for the most part across the world, they borrow short term uh, and then they lend out long term. They will borrow from the Federal Reserve. They'll borrow from financial big institutions. Then they'll lend out to their customers, usually longer term, right? For mortgages, for other types of products. So the spread between these two is very important. Now, the short term usually is close to zero for most companies and most countries in the world right now. So the higher the interest rate for the longer term is, usually the more money is. So when the U.S. 10 year goes up, this is the longer end of the range, the more money banks can make. And this is resulting in outperformance in, again, XLF, which I've been talking about for a while, which is U.S. banks. And the U.S. banks, I still look, still think looking at the chart here, it looks kind of interesting because it hasn't caught up at all. Uh, well, not up at all. It's caught up a little bit, but it still has a way to go to catch up to pre-coronavirus levels. Looking at XLE, the energy sector, it also still has a way to catch up. Uh, but I like especially looking at the XLF. It still looks interesting to me on the fact that volume had a pretty nice pickup the last. It's still summer low, so it's not big, but this is a nice chart. This is a nice chart pattern. It's breaking higher and the MACD is uh, it, it's moving up, even though this is not a nice, it's not a beautiful cross up, but it is moving up. Uh, and the RSI is above 50, indicating to me that it, it is still in an upward trend. And I think that this will continue to push up the Dow. Why? Because the Dow has a larger sector weight in the financials. It also has this larger sector weight in the industrials, which industrials, I think that there's going to be continued to be money flowing out of uh, tech uh let's say consumer discretionary some of these areas that have performed very very well uh they've gone way above the pre-coronavirus highs this is consumer discretionary this is tech i think money is going to be flowing out he of here as in people will be selling stocks here and deploying their cash they will be rebalancing uh whatever you want to call it uh re reallocating their money into financials energy and most likely probably some industrials as well. And this is going to benefit, I think, the New York Dow, the Dow Jones, because it has a higher weight in this compared to the S&P 500. And I actually think that going longer term, what's gonna happen is the performance between the Dow Jones and uh, let's say the S&P or the uh, NASDAQ is going to continue to uh, converge. Uh, what do I mean by converge? Right now, the NASDAQ is up about I don't know, 47% on the year, 48% in the year. The Dow is only up about 10% up in the year. I think that there's going to be convergence as in uh, there's going to be a decreasing of this gap as in the Dow is going to start catching up to the NASDAQ. We'll look at the chart right here or not the chart. So the Dow is only up 8.5% in the year. NASDAQ's up about 47%. I think this will continue to converge into year end. So this is a lot to take in. 
What's my recommendation at the end of the day, Dan? What do you recommend? Again, guys, take this with a grain of salt. I'm one in, one investor, one two, two one one mind, just one person. So please do your own due diligence. Investing is self responsibility at the end of the day. I think that this is actually an interesting time, uh, short term and long term, uh, to be putting deploying cash in different areas. So longer term. Uh, Right now, I think that within the sector, if you hold U.S. stocks, longer term investment, this is for a retirement account, anything over one year, longer time horizon, 401k, whatever you want to look at. I think this is a good time to be maybe rotating out of your tech sector stocks, your consumer discretionary stocks, maybe even retail stocks and reallocating that into financials, energy and industrials. You can do this using ETFs. You can do this, do this using individual stocks. It's up to you. But that's my recommendation within this green area to uh, this is called a re, re uh, you can call it uh, asset rotation. You can call it rebalancing, whatever, maybe call it rotation just to keep it simple. So asset rotation, that's my recommendation longer term. Short term, I continue to recommend what I've been recommending before, which is hold on to this XLF uh investment that i've been recommending this is a short-term investment so anything between a few days and a few months uh, again i recommend doing both short-term and long-term i recommend doing it in two different brokerage accounts so you don't get confused also so you can measure the performance so long term you hold on to this stuff you don't really do that much changing once in a while rotation like i'm talking about now but the most part you keep it into the short term short term is 30 to 10 percent of your net worth and I recommend what I've said before, XLF. I've been talking about this since, well, I don't know, before this move up here. Sometime around the beginning of August, I've liked it. It's up, moved nicely higher. I still think it looks nice. And I've recommended to buy XLF. And for every $2 of XLF you buy, or $3 of XLF you buy, short $1 of QQQ. So as in, do a hedge. But you'll be net long, as in you'll hold more XLF than you are short QQQ. So it results in something of a hedge now this is actually a hedge where it's an equal hedge so it's not really a perfect chart but overall hold xlf and maybe short a little bit of qqq as a hedge for short term i hope you guys enjoy this video i hope it made sense i hope all the content made sense i was kind of talking about a lot of different things Feel free to shoot me with your questions. Let me know what other topics you want to hear. Uh, I will be doing another topic about Bitcoin, about Ethereum, about gold and whatnot. I'll do that tomorrow because I got a ton of different requests. Uh, but also, guys, speak up. Let me know any other topics you want to hear. I will try to fit it into the program. But please take note this week that this announcement from the Fed is very big. It is reflationary. It should have an impact, continue to have an impact a little bit longer term. I think on uh, some of these stocks such as financials and energy and industrials, especially the financials, I think. So thanks very much, guys, for listening to the video. And I hope you have a great weekend. Ciao.